All right, our second speaker today is Eric Lees Morgan. Eric Lees Morgan is a digital projects librarian at the Hesburgh Libraries. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, sir. Excellent. At the University of Notre Dame, his primary responsibilities surround work on the Catholic portal, the digitization of Catholic literature. Um, and a quick note, so if you're ever scheduling a conference, make sure you don't put the guy coming the furthest away in the front of the pack in case there are things like train delays or bad weather or anything. So uh, without further ado, Eric Lees Morgan. <laughs> Uh, good morning. Thank you very much for having me. I always enjoy uh, sharing uh, the things that I'm uh, doing because it forces me to put down in paper uh, things that are kind of floating around in my brain. So that's, that's a good time. Um, my goal today is to share with you uh, some information about a thing that we call, colloquially call the Catholic Portal. It's the uh, Catholic Research Resources Alliance. And I want to more specifically describe to you how we are using Viewfind as our implementation tool. And I also want to describe some of the ways that we have uh, exploited Viewfind. And I'd also like to show and demonstrate some of the ways that uh, I would like to see us push the definition of library catalog. So that's the, uh, that's the big thing. OK? We're on the right track? Wonderful. Um, I work for the University of Notre Dame, and about five or six years ago, uh, the University of Notre Dame started a thing that uh, we call the Catholic Research Resources Alliance. The purpose of the alliance is to bring together rare, infrequently held, and uncommon materials uh, of a Catholic nature to support Catholic research. Um, the idea uh, mostly started out with libraries and library archives. What cool content do we have that we can bring together and then allow uh, Catholic scholarship to happen? And it started out with bigger libraries and institutions like the University of Notre Dame, like Georgetown, like Marquette, like Catholic University. Um, and uh, we brought all, all our stuff together. And that is evolving now to include more uh, ar different types of archives, uh, uh, smaller institutions, because we're discovering and we know that not just big libraries have this sort of stuff, but lots of different types of institutions have these sorts of things, rare and frequently held types of materials. And we're trying to bring it all together and provide access to these uh, things to facilitate Catholic scholarship. Um, Here's the website. Yay, we've all seen a website a million and one times. Um, in, when we first started out, we were doing a lot of library-related things. Okay, what kind of metadata does a library have? <laughs> Let's try again. What, I'll ask more specifically. What format does, do libraries usually manifest their metadata in. Yay! And, and so at that particular time, um, I was charged with the technical imp implementation of these sorts of things, and I needed a tool that would essentially index and provide access to the index of MARC records. This was about, I'm not sure how many years ago now, at least four. And there were a few choices out there, um, and, and Viewfind was definitely one of them. Um, not only that, it came from a Catholic institution. Hey, well, that was pretty cool. So we adopted, or I adopted, Viewfind as the tool to index um, our MARC records. And it, uh, it, it proved out to be very, very useful. And so I would amass my MARC records from my institution, and then I had friends at other institutions, and they would send me via email their MARC records, and I would stuff them all into Viewfind, and I had it, uh, and it worked, and did what it was supposed to do. But um, a problem was, is that increasingly the content that we were interested in were uh, from archives. And what flavor of metadata do archivists kind of sort of usually put their content in? EAD. EAD. And, ah, uh, 
how am I supposed to index these EAD files uh, uh, with, with my essentially my mark record editor types of uh, indexing tool? Well, lo and behold, uh, yummy, yummy, um, the viewfind uh, morphed just a little bit, kind of sort of just at the right time, and said, you don't have to index this kind of metadata. If you use this particular technique, you can index lots of different types of metadata. And so that's exactly what I did. I be began to amass people's EAD files, and then I wrote another little computer program that would loop through the EAD files, pull out the necessary metadata, and then stuff it into ViewFind. And it worked very, very well. Um, uh, and I would not have been able to do that if ViewFind had not been as modular and as flexible as it really was. That was very exciting. Uh, incidentally, um, if you know anything about EAD files, they essentially come in, there's two parts, kind of, sort of. There's the header part of your EAD file, which is very much akin to a MARC record. Lots of controlled vocabulary terms, lots of provenance, names, addresses, telephone numbers, these sorts of things. And then in the body of an EAD file, there's lots of little specific things. These are uh, container level descriptions. These are the things, I have this folder and it has these papers in it. I have this box and it has these sorts of things in it. Well, what's interesting about my particular implementation is that we don't index only the top level part. We index every little thing that goes on down into the container level. That's interesting, but it's also difficult because a lot of times that sort of metadata is really terse. Papers, 1950. Correspondence, 1960 to 1965. But that's better than this giant um, uh, uh, metadata uh, value up at the way up at the top. So that's all very interesting. And I'll do a little bit of show and tell here in just a little bit. We've also done a little bit of indexing of uh, Dublin Core content. We've done a little bit of uh, harvesting from the web, uh, that uh, from via OAI, that content is essentially uh, Dublin Core, and again, using the same technique that's in Viewfind, I can index that. I've also begun to index content from a, another archival system called PassPerfect, which again is very similar to OAI and Dublin Core uh, content. Done a couple of other things that are interesting. Um, of indexed content harvested from the Internet Archive. That was a lot of fun. Um, one of our portal partners is the uh, uh, University of Toronto. And as you may or may not know, the University of Toronto has been working with the Internet Archive for a long time. They send a lot of stuff out there. And the people who determined what kind of content should be apropos for the portal uh, sent me Internet Archive unique identifiers, okay? And what I can then do is I can write a little robot program that will go to the Internet Archive, pull down a PDF version of the thing that was digitized, pull down a text file, an OCR version of the thing that was digitized, and pull down a marked record describing the thing. Now I've collected those things locally on my local hard drive, and then because I have marked records, I can go through and I can feed them to ViewFind, which is I, I think is pretty interesting because, um, because, well, I can get stuff from the Internet Archive, which is good, and I think libraries are also about preservation sorts of things. Lots of copies keep stuff safe, and so I like the idea of having this file locally instead of always linking out there to this remote location. Uh, that sort of scares me. Is the Internet Ar Archive always going to be there? Uh, well, you'd like to think so, but if I have a local copy. But there are other cool things that I can do if I have the local copy. Um, but before I get to that, let me do the tiniest of demonstrations. And I realize the font is small and everything gets, everything gets munged. Um, this is the home page. These things, these things up here at the top describe the, the, uh, the uh, portal in general, who we are, who's involved, these sorts of things. I think maybe I'll show one map 
to give an illustration of how many portal members there are. Every time you do a computer demonstration, something goes wrong. Here's a tiny little map, and sooner or later, these little pins are supposed to show up. I'll count to 10. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Fail. <laughs> but there's supposed to be a bunch of pins there on that little map. Uh, there's about 24 pins, and they're from all across the, uh, the country, illustrating the, the, uh, who, who, our, who our members are. If I do a simple search, I just search for everything in the portal. It comes back, hopefully, uh, with uh, every time you do a computer demonstration, something goes wrong. And this is pretty much your typical view, viewfind output. We have approximately 286,000 records in this thing. Uh, the facets across the uh, the facets across the side illustrate the types of content that are available. Um, I'm not going to show you how to do a search. You've seen that a million and one times. You put in words, it brings back results. You know, not a big deal. But one of the things that are kind of fun is uh, again the the content that I've been able to. Uh, deal with from the University of Toronto. Let's see, where is that one? Please, please. Letters of an Irish Catholic payment. Whew. Okay, so um, the folks from Toronto said these uh, 400 or 500 records are apropos for the portal. I harvested from the, them from the Internet Archive. I kept the PDF copy locally. I kept the text file locally. And then using any one of these uh, links on here, you can read, the P you can see the PDF document. But one thing that I have been doing a little bit differently is allowing people to read the document from a distance. Um, and it, it, using a, a thing that we call text mining techniques. Um, I have uh, this interface, and it will, sooner or later, it's thinking about it. We'll blame it on the internet connection. How about that? Um, this here is a, a, a simple interface that allows you to read the document from a distance. I have the plain text of the document, okay? And using this sort of tool, I can do some cheesy things. Show me all the words in this document that begin with the letter G. And it will come back and it searches the text. And I realize it's very small, so I'll read it to you. Uh, uh, go, Gable, Gabriel, Gad, Gaddis, Gang, Gage, 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 Gavrimit, Gone, Gainsboro. It's kind of like an automatic back of the book index uh, generator. I can see what words begin with this particular letter. That's cheesy. How about this one? Show me the 250 most frequently used words in the text. And it comes back with words that are usually stop words, a day, one, la. But then the most significant word is Catholic. This word Catholic appears 798 times in this particular document. Um, made, great, time, Canada, country, now, people, Irish, first years, government, these sorts of things. Now I'm going to click on the word Catholic. And when I click on the word Catholic, it's going to bring me back a concordance type of thing that allows, that illustrates how the word Catholic is used throughout this particular document. I can do other sorts of things with this tool. For example, search or sort the, the thing. It's fun to sort them on the right. And you will then begin to see uh, patterns. And so there are patterns like Catholic affairs, Catholic affairs, Catholic affairs, Catholic and American, 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 Catholic and, 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 and. I wonder how Catholics are defined. How would you define a Catholic? Catholics are. Catholic is. And so is there Catholic are or Catholic is in this document? Catholic and, and, ah, here's some. Catholics are wide as the poles are asunder. Uh, thoughtful Catholics are endeavoring in several places. Catholics are not beyond hand. The point I'm trying to make is, with this sort of tool, you can begin to extract meaning from the text um, and, and uh, very quickly. Uh, I didn't say this was a replacement for reading. 
I said that this is an alternative. This is a way of extracting things. Now here's a cool thing too. If I scroll up here and I do this little map. If I do this little map, this map illustrates where the word Catholic appears in the text. And where does the word Catholic not appear? Kind of sort of in the middle of the book. Okay? All right, well, that's just, just a fact. Just a fact. But if I go back here and I do this 50 word thing, or this frequently used word thing again, and I say go, I can begin to see if, I'm cor if I remember correctly. Oh, is this correct? Government shall, England, number, uh, Niagara is one of the words. Quebec is one of the words that appears a lot. Um, this might not be the correct, correct one, but if I look for the word, say, Niagara, question government, Manitoba, where's mine? I'll just type it in here. Niagara. I'm crossing my fingers. I spelled it wrong. N Ni Ag Ra. That was G A R A. N what? G A R A. Stupid operating system is helping me. Okay, and then if I do map. Ah, now where does the word Niagara appear in this document? Where, where Catholic doesn't. What does that mean? Okay, now maybe it doesn't mean anything. <laughs> but it would be a clue to the reader that maybe something interesting is going on here. And you could use this sort of tool to look for a flow of information. Um, maybe, um, maybe they transmit, they, they start off with one idea and then they move to another and they come back to it come back to the beginning idea again. I don't know, but it's an interesting tool, okay? Um, and this is all part of, of the Catholic portal. There's other sorts of cheesy things that I've done in here. Uh, colors. This is a canned search for colors. And I find out that this is all the times that I could, this, uh, these colors have been used in this book. Okay? Um, uh, uh, now, you could count that. You could count the, how big the book is and how many times the colors are used, and then you can do a ratio, and you could say, this is a colorful book. <laughs> no, that might be important. You're doing poetry, and you want to compare and contrast. Okay? You could do other sorts of things, too. Like, um, <clears throat> I've done this one. Uh, <laughs> big names. In the 1950s, a guy from the University of Chicago comes out and he says these were the great books of the Western world. And it was all written by a bunch of dead white guys. Okay? I can take those names of those dead white guys and I can do a search and I can look for those words in the text. And you can begin to get an idea. Do they quote St. Augustine a lot? Do they quote Thomas Aquinas a lot? Or they talk about Thoreau and Emerson instead. It give you a flavor for what kind of book or material the thing is. This is all about text mining. This is going a little bit beyond uh, what, it ha what it means to do library, I think. I'm going to make that small. I'm back at the portal. And let's see what else I wanted to explain. I'm almost done. Um, harvest that come from the internet, index uh, EAD files, index other sorts of content. When it comes to viewfind, I am not extraordinarily well versed in PHP and uh, uh, JavaScript. That's just not, it's like saying, well, I can read Italian, but I can't read French. Um, and this has been a particular challenge for me in supporting this, th this particular tool. But the community is growing, and the community is very supportive. Uh, that's, that's a good thing. I could do better, though, if I had better PHP skills. 
Another thing is that ViewFind is an open source uh, application, and it is important to, um, for the developer to write their program in such a way, or write their enhancements in such a way, so that when new versions of ViewFind come out, you can just drop in your enhancements. ViewFind's been around for uh, how long now, guys? How long has ViewFind been around? Four or five years, something like that. I went out and visited people who were using ViewFind, and they, they loved it. It's great. I can change this. My reference people love it because I can change that, blah, 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 blah. But they didn't go through the whole process and change their code and make their code so that it was easy. It was either in the, in, in the uh, uh, distribution and easier to, to re-implement, or they, and, and then when new version came out, they had a million and one things that they had to tweak. You've got to stay away from that. It takes extra effort to do open source software so that you can uh, uh, migrate along with the application. That's, that's a very important thing. Oh, only a couple more ideas. We've had some problems with the CRA that this is essentially a union catalog right now. And not everyone codes their mark records the same. Not everyone encodes their EAD, EAD files exactly the same. And there are rules written into ViewFind that says extract this and do this and do that and do the other thing to display this kind of content. And to do that, I have to, we have to have the metadata be consistent from, uh, from institution to institution to institution. And sometimes that's very difficult. This is the way we do it here at institution A, but no, 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 we do it like this over here at institution B. And that's a very challenging thing for the portal in general. And uh, lastly, I would like to, um, I would like to use this, this tool to enhance some of the ideas of definition of library catalog. It will only work if we have the full text available in our particular collections, and increasingly we do. That, as Joe alluded to earlier, it's not so much uh, important that we be libraries and, and warehouses but what can we do to make the information more useful, more meaningful? And here's an example. Um, the, page, the number of pages in a text is ambiguous. I might have one particular book, and it might be a large print book, and it's going to have n number of pages. But then I might have a paperback, and it's going to have n minus m pages in it. And then I might have the hard copy version, and it is yet a different number of pages. The length of a book in terms of pages doesn't make much sense. But if you have the full text of a book, you can count the number of words in the book. And then you get a much better idea. Now, in this particular case, uh, I pulled together the texts from uh, A Christmas Carol, Oliver Twist, and David Copperfield. And I counted the number of words. And I have a collection of electronic text is about 14,000. And I counted the number of words in all of my books. And once I did that, I can average the number of words in each of all the books. And then once I have an average, I can pull out any book and say it's below the average or it's above the average. And if it's above the average, it's a long book. And if it's below the average, it's a short book. Now this might be important. I only have time to read and I might want a shorter book. Or I want something that's thorough. I might want a longer book. We could put that into our library catalogs. We could put that into our catalogs and make that part of the searchable. In the 1950s and 1960s, there were these guys that came out and they said, uh, um, we need to calculate how difficult a particular book is. And to do that, you count the number of words, the number of sentences, the number of paragraphs, how difficult the words are, and you can do lots of math. And when you do that, you find out that Dr. Seuss is consistently easy to read. <laughs> okay? But insurance forms, insurance policies, are notoriously difficult. If you have the full text, you can calculate this and add that to your metadata, and then I can say, I want a difficult book that's really hard, uh, that's really short, on philosophy. I think that would be interesting. We could do other things if we had more quantitative information in our uh, uh, catalogs. Um, we could do uh, uh, dates are notorious. 
bad dates. We don't have dates in our catalogs. We have bracket 19 dash dash bracket. Well, you can't add that number. That doesn't make any sense. Okay? And in the library catalogs, we put in when the thing was published. And so when I'm looking at Plato's Dialogues, and it was published last year, it's going to have a date of 2010. Ah, that doesn't make any sense. I need an additional date. And what if I wanted to read all of, all of Thoreau's works? And let's suppose the library had all of Thoreau's works. I want to show me the oldest one, the previous one first, and I want to read them through chronologically and show how the, see how the thing has evolved. I can't do that with a library catalog. We don't have enough, we don't have enough uh, quantitative information. We can put these sorts of concordances against our catalog. I think that would be a good thing. Here's a good thing. I brought together all the works of Plato, Aristotle, and Shakespeare. I then counted the words that were used frequently, the phrases. And the word good man was in all three, often. So then I applied a concordance against these sorts of things. How does Plato and Aristotle use the phrase good man? And how does Shakespeare use the word good man? Well, Plato and Aristotle, they talk about knowledge and justice and, and the man is a leader and all these sorts of things. And, and Shakespeare says, ah, my good man Othello, how are you today? <laughs> you can compare and contrast those sorts of things quickly uh, if, if we do this. Um, here's a, another example. In, um, it's very tiny. It's a network diagram. In, in Walden, there's this, uh, this guy. He lives beside a pond for about 18 months, and he hates woodchucks. They eat his beans. He really doesn't like these things. And when I do, I, I look for the words that appear frequently around the word woodchuck in a Walden, and I get words like uh, last, skin, man, dog, a woodchuck, cold. Those are the words that appear frequently around the word woodchuck. He wrote another book, A Week on the Merrimack and Concord Rivers, and he goes down and he talks about woodchucks there. And when he talks about woodchucks there, he talks about foxes and minks and birds. How difficult would that have been to deal with and discover if I had to read the book? And it might be just a clue. It might be just a clue. More graphs and charts, more graphs and charts. And I think I'm going to stop right about there. The Catholic portal uh, uses viewfind as its tool to bring together lots of metadata. Um, we've had some challenges, but we've had more successes than not. Um, and we're trying to see whether or not we can use uh, uh, ViewFind and the definition of catalog to go a little bit more further uh, in library land. Thank you very much for your attention. Am I over my time? Uh, we're going to take questions now. Does anybody have any questions for Eric? If we can start stage left, we can go ahead. Um, this reminds me of the bookland.org, um, bookland.org, Google's project to kind of um, do the same thing. Count the words, read words to match up users with similar books. Like uh huh. Okay. Pandora.com does. Um, and so I love your idea of, you know, in, in that case, they're trying to get people to buy similar books. But using that that tool of the text mining in libraries, um, my other question was: Have you had any examples of researchers using those tools um, and kind of some papers or research that came out of that? No, not yet. Okay. No, not not yet. That's the no. <laughs> um, yes, sir. You talked about being able to sort uh, through chronologically based on when it was written or, or, or maybe when it was published. We also talked about Plato showing up when it was published. I mean, you get into a lot of uh, kind of tricky details there as far as deciphering you know, when something was actually written versus when it was published. I think we use publish date because it's an easier number to get. But we don't always have that. Um, I mean, is that, is that something that, that libraries and catalogs should be in the business of doing is trying to figure those dates out? Should is a very strong word. <laughs> should libraries be in the business of doing that sort of thing? I, if it were up to me, the answer would be a qualified yes. 
Um, again, it's it, it, uh, we are. I don't think that the library catalog is essentially an inventory. This is a list of the stuff I got. Well, and, and here's a tool that I use to help you find the stuff that I got. Well, increasingly, find is not the problem people need to solve. I don't know about you guys, but I can find lots of stuff really easily. And I know that it might not be the best stuff and the most correct stuff, but I think we've all but approached a point of diminishing returns. And you and I go, it needs, it can be better, but everybody else goes, I just put a couple words and I get back pretty much what I'm looking for. And scholarship isn't going down the drain because of this. And I think that libraries can enhance and make tools that make it easier for them to do their scholarship if there are things like uh, more different types of dates in our catalogs. And th that particular idea, though, might be easier implemented when it comes to journal articles. Because almost always, the date that they have associated with a journal article or an RSS feed or something like that is the date that the thing was conceived. I think that there's more solutions to that than, uh, th than there are exceptions. And therefore, I, I, and I can probably assume that the publication date of Walden was the same date that it was like, conceived. Um, and I know more or less when Plato's uh, dialogues were, were conceived. And they weren't in 300, and it wasn't in 500. It was probably 600 BC, something like that. And that's a whole lot better than 2010. Um, I, this is so exciting because it brings things alive. You know, the text I've had coffee. <laughs> the, the, the textual, the documents that are available in full text, but I'm thinking about all of the bridge Catholic resources that are three-dimensional, the vestments, the, you know, all that stuff. And also I'm thinking about the, the, the huge growth in oral history going on and the untapped, um, you know, so do you, do you care to say anything about how viewfind can help uh, bring that stuff more alive, just the Catholic? resources uh, available or it won't the answer to that question won't really be viewfind as much as it is the the CRRA the organization viewfind is just the mechanism um, but the goal would be for the CRA to amass either at least the descriptions of your oral histories of your vestments pictures of chalices things like that and to bring that together index that metadata and provide access to the index via <coughs> viewfind um, is but there it, interest to do that? Yes. Though? I mean, I, I there is and there Catholic, isn't. There's all this great stuff, and uh, you know, it takes time. That's right. Money, there, there is definitely uh, interest, yeah. but there is not always the the proper. No, that's not the word. I don't want to use the word proper. Sometimes there are impediments. Yeah. Um, I am understaffed. I'm already work going as fast as I can. Now you want me to send the, you this metadata. Um, I am working as fast as I can, and I don't have time to digitize these particular things. I work in an archive, uh, and I work, I work in an institution, and if I make my stuff available on the web, they won't come visit me anymore. Ah. Um, um, some of the things in my archive I can describe, but I'm really not allowed to give people access to the thing. That's another fact of the matter. Um, so there's all those sorts of uh, impediments and barriers, and some of them are political, some of them are financial, uh, and so, but that's not gonna stop us from, from continuing. And if we had metadata about vestments, and if we had pictures and movies, at the very least, we would be able to index that content and hopefully provide access with including the URL to see the thing or to read the oral, a transcription of the oral history or to listen to the oral history. All that is entirely possible. It's just a matter of getting the people together with the metadata to uh, put it into the portal. Let's do it. <laughs> yes, sir. In our own local environments, in our own um, commitments to developing a future-oriented mission, we need to start making those kinds of things 
priorities for investment because that's the unique cultural terrain and social terrain we occupy. We need to stop worrying about a lot of other things and doing this new stuff. And that's how it's going to happen in terms of having resources. It's really a, an issue of, of redirecting existing resources to more important future-oriented work. That's really the issue. And that's very hard. Well, well it's very it's hard, hard but, but if we don't do it, and if we don't do it over the next five years, let's say, as institutions, libraries are truly threatened in terms of their future viability. So the issue here is if we want to have a future, we want to do these things because they create new value for libraries. It's not visible in our legacy practices to a lot of our constituents. So it's really a question about waking up and taking steps to do these things now or in the next year or two because um, you know there's there's a lot of pressure in terms of uh, who funds us and what they see our value as being. And I think, you know, this is kind of going to a sermon, but I really think there's unique terrain here that we need to figure out how to claim because no one else is going to do it. And, and the value of doing it is enormous. And I'll just add another little thing. One of the things that we're, this is real news probably for the people who don't know about this. We have a um, member of our staff here who's working on a project called the Black Villanova Project was trying to create a series of oral histories about the experiences of the earliest African-American students who came to Villanova. And he came to me and said, can we ingest the audio recordings and, and then transcribe these into the digital library? So this is going to be a unique body of institutional material that talks to history in a very specific way. And those are the kinds of things we need to be doing um, because they demonstrate the very specific cultural mission li mission libraries have. And that's why I think uh, this is really exciting. This is really yeah. great stuff. Yeah. We need to go back and do this stuff in our own backyards, too. Well, we need more visionary directors of libraries that are, you know, that see this value and that, that take it back to the, you know, the board of directors, the provosts, the presidents, you know, and support their, their staff to Thank you. Incredible myopia at the level of leadership in the profession. Although I think it's beginning to change, and I think things like the DPLA are an example of, of pressure for change. I think that really interesting to me is the pressures for change have often come from outside libraries, um, and it's partly because libraries have been really afraid of being taken over by technologists in some ways, because we do have to take on a new technical mission. And that means that the people with power in libraries are not going to be the librarians traditionally defined. But you know, that's a reality that we got to deal with. Any, anything else? Just to add on to that, I think the smartest technologists are the ones that realize the content is king. Yeah, it's not about the book, right. it's about the things in the book, yeah. it's the ideas. And the knowledge that's in the book, and I think that's where kind of libraries messed up. Um, they keep thinking about this thing, and the thing changes over time. But it's really the Plato's ideas that are important, uh, and, and not so much the the, the manifestation. True, I agree. I, no, I, I, no, honestly, I agree. I really do. I even make my own books. Okay, <laughs> I'm with you. <laughs> Right. We're not, we're, a carpenter is not a hammer specialist. They're a builder. A surgeon is not a scalpel specialist. They're a healer. Why are librarians so much associated with the tool? I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, all these mining tools could be d done against uh, that sort of content. I see, now it's, uh, I've used what's called a, uh, 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 what's called a bag of words approach to text mining. It just takes all the words and puts them into a great big co container and, and you analyze the words. Um, but to do citation analysis or other sorts of analysis, it really helps if you have marked up your document. Uh, and that doesn't always happen. So citation analysis would be a little bit difficult because the citations aren't always marked up. 
the syntax of a citation isn't consistent. It takes a rocket scientist to write a computer program that parses a citation and pulls out all of its cool stuff, uh, e essentially. But it, it can be definitely be used for that sort of thing. Thank you very, very much for your time.